Welcome to the session on vitamins and nutrition. Today we are going to look at one more vitamin which is a fat soluble vitamin. Basically there are different categories of vitamin that we have been looking so far and today's discussion would center around on a water soluble vitamin. So we have already covered a uh, lot of fat soluble vitamins and we started with water soluble vitamins. So in today's content we are going to discuss on uh, one of the most important water soluble vitamin called niacin. So today I am going to give you uh, the overview of the historic aspect of niacin discovery and its uh, metabolic role, what kind of function it is uh, doing in our human physiology. We are also going to look into the sources of niacin and uh, we are going to look very closely on its historic discovery and how vitamin is being closely associated with some of the well known uh, deficiency diseases of this particular vitamin called niacin. So today we are going to look at uh, this slide is normally uh, we have been looking at this particular slide to do a comparison between water soluble vitamin and fat soluble vitamin and uh, I want you to recap what we have been doing so far. So this slide tells you how exactly water soluble vitamin and fat soluble vitamin differ in terms of the sources as well as the way in which they interact with our system. So if you look at over here there are many precursors concerned with water soluble vitamins and these precursors are uh, essential in synthesizing or making use of the macronutrients. Whereas here you have fat soluble vitamins they are more or less like a kind of hormone they act and here you find they are non-toxic even if taken in large quantity because they will be excreted by kidneys whereas here they get accumulated especially they are stored in the liver and can even lead to fatty liver and other toxicities. So you, you see over here our body frequently needs a dose of water soluble vitamins and most of the vegetable sources being a rich source of water soluble vitamins and you also have other meat products which are very essential in providing water soluble vitamins. So quickly we are going to look into the water soluble vitamin what we have been already looking up. So, so far we have seen thiamine and today I am going to explain you about niacin. Niacin is a very interesting water soluble vitamin. So if you look at niacin uh, you have a very interesting precursor. See this very word niacin basically comes from a combination of two words nicotinic acid plus vitamin. So you see the first one niacin because earlier when nicotinic acid that is how it was originally known was synthesized by Hugo Viral uh, I mean relatively a very long period of time. So Hugo D. Viral basically proposed the structure of uh, white niacin for quite a long time and uh, the history of niacin is quite uh, astounding because they actually associated this with a kind of a disorder connected with pellagra. So if you look at this, this particular nicotinic acid was the original name as Hugo Vidal had synthesized this but it took a very long time for them to really associate nicotinic acid with uh, the so called deficiency conditions associated with nicotinic acid. Okay, so you look over here this nicotinic acid is basically uh, totally different from nicotine because earlier when it was established that it is a wonderful water soluble vitamin and uh, which could completely reverse pellagra symptoms people normally thought nicotinic acid the very name was misleading. So they thought it to be something connected with nicotine smoking and probably cigarettes. So to make a public appeal I mean good and uh, also to make compliance for dietary supplement of niacin they just modified the name niacin and they came up with this name niacin by taking up this nicotinic acid and vitamin together and now officially nicotinic acid is more popularly known as niacin. So this is how the etymology of the name came into place. If you look at when officially that nicotinic acid or niacin has been reported dates back to 1762. Here you find Gaspar Castle, a Spanish physician 
actually he records a disease called pellagra okay so this is a kind of a disease uh, actually in the spanish he mentions this as mal de la rose which means a red rash seen on the hands and feet of sufferers okay so they were like looking at what exactly could be the problem of uh, this particular disease called pellagra so if you look into certain historic aspects of pellagra the very word pellagra looks over here something like from a italian name because when it was first reported in northern italy okay so you see there pellagra so holly like you have this this is a plant very a popular plant normally even displayed during christmas season and it's actually a plant which produces an alkaloidal fruit and it could be quite poisonous but the kind of association they made with this particular plant was the red fruit so when people suffer from pellagra they develop a kind of this oily like skin a kind of a red skin okay and uh, since it resembles this kind of a condition for people who were on a specific diet see look over here this particular person the epidemiologist joseph goldberger is basically uh, made that kind of a connecting link between pellagra and the diet so what he did was so the early physician caspar gasel and many of the physicians in the italy made an association that whenever people were taking corn or maize a diet which was very poor diet consists of only corn or maize actually developed this kind of a disorder called pellagra so when this condition was being uh, what do you say questioned and known for centuries uh, very few people really made any kind of scientific progress to make a productive connect between these two conditions so all the credit goes to uh, dr joseph goldberger and he is a person who actually discovered this exact nutrient and made this connection so what he did was he did lot of studies uh, among uh, the prisoners and uh, he quickly realized that when the diet was incomplete or probably the diet was consists of only the poor uh, diet of corn or maize then these people very soon developed symptoms of pellagra so if you look at uh, this particular person uh, who were uh, the christian hikman who actually is supported to have uh, done lot of experiments in fowls depriving them of essential vitamins and then looking for the symptoms so taking his way there were other two scientists who contributed in establishing the condition see for example dr conrad uh, evilgen actually discovered collagra uh, in connection with the vitamin uh, niacin so the goldberger's contribution was he could make an association between the corn and the maize uh, alone diet with symptoms of pellagra but he could not make a real connection between the exact component so then came the conrad and his teammates they actually identified and they also did one more interesting thing they reduced one of the essential amino acids as you see over here tryptophan so when tryptophan was also deficit in the diet eventually that led to uh, dietary deficiency of niacin and people started developing symptoms of pellagra so you look over here they actually discovered two kinds of vitamins uh, now we know both of them refer to the same vitamin but it's a little chemical derivative one is basically the nicotinic acid which is also known as the niacin and the other one is basically an amide derivative of nicotinic acid which is called the nicotinamide so dr tom spice also contributed uh, to the development of this understanding about the disease origin of pellagra by experimenting with millions of people who were suffering from this particular condition in the southern america so here all these people came up with finally a good connection between this particular vitamin nicotinic acid and one more derivative which we consider to be even more effective than nicotinic acid it's basically the amide derivative if you look at it if you look into the chemistry of this particular structure so you see pyridine over there okay so you have a heterocyclic 
six membered ring called pyridine and a carboxylic acid attached to it. So, that is what we call it like nicotinic acid or niacin. So, you see there the amide derivative which is basically nicotinamide is basically a carboxylic acid being converted into an amide form that is basically COnH2. So, there is an amide form and there is an acid form and both are essentially useful. In fact, nicotinamide is even more potent compared to nicotinic acid. So, if you look at the diet, yeah, you normally get it from a well balanced diet and suppose if somebody runs short of this particular vitamin as a deficiency condition, then they can also supplement it as a pure vitamin from different sources. And nowadays having well studied and characterized this particular vitamin, people are recommended to take vitamin uh, niacin on a regular basis when they suffer from some conditions and especially pellagra which is a well known established disease of niacin can be reversed when you supply niacin on a regular basis. So, now we are going to look at this particular uh, structure which is a very interesting structure. So, what exactly this nicotinic acid is doing? So, where this nicotinic acid finds its uh, role in the biochemical uh, functions in the human physiology. So, you see over there this particular compound either in the form of an acid or in the form of a nicotinamide. So, either way they are forming a part of NAD nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So, can you see over there here you have the base, here you have the sugar and here you have the phosphate molecule. So, you need to have a base in this case niacin provides the base for NAD which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate and now in this case you find an amide version of the nicotinic acid again being incorporated into uh, what do you say the fundamental energy molecule NADPH. So, if you carefully notice you find NAD and NADPH two important molecule playing a primary role in incorporating niacin. So, what is the role of niacin now? Niacin is extremely essential in synthesizing NAD and also in synthesizing NADPH. This NAD and NADPH are the two counterparts of oxidized and reduced form without which the cellular functions concerned with energy metabolism of mitochondria cannot actually happen. So, in that way niacin or nicotinic acid is extremely useful in terms of elucidating many of the biochemical functions concerned with energy metabolism inside the mitochondria. So, I want you to have a closer look. So, here you have the oxidized form of NAD plus or NADP uh, D plus NAD and NADB plus both are basically the functional forms and as you see over there the reduced form is NADH NADPH. So, that is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide because you have uh, two nucleotides. So, it is called dinucleotide nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide phosphate. So, here you have a phosphorylated version of NADPH. So, you look over there this source of vitamin is quite interesting. So, you could get them from a wide variety of sources from like broccoli, peanuts, and chicken and mushrooms and probably peppers and then you also get it from kidney beans. In addition to that you would have recollected this slide, I displayed the same slide when we were studying about thiamine. As far as the deficiency is concerned whether it be for thiamine or whether it be for niacin the sources are almost the same. So, you see over there rich sources being outer coatings of food grain like rice, wheat, yeast and so on. Similarly, the good sources would be whole cereals, pulses, oil seeds and nuts all these are excellent sources that is why in this picture we see here nuts especially peanuts and other kinds of nuts which are also capable of producing an excellent source of niacin. So, you look over here other fair sources of niacin being meat, liver, egg and fish. So, the previous picture tells you even the non-vegetarian source of chicken 
could be an excellent source of vitamin B3. Now, we are going to look at what exactly this particular vitamin is doing. So, this vitamin which is niacin is extremely important in the biochemical pathway. So, you see over there glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate which is one of the most important preliminary material in the glycolytic pathway and now you have inorganic phosphate and here you have NAD plus which gets converted to NADH which in turn is responsible for synthesizing uh, 3 bis phosphoglycerate. So, you see over there this is the enzyme and the enzyme exactly fits into the corresponding products to carry over the complicated reaction I would say the routine biochemical reaction in a body towards the production of energy. So, imagine you cannot do this reaction without NAD plus or NADPH. Similarly, lactate dehydrogenase one more enzyme. So, this is one of the most uh, important cofactor that is required by this corresponding enzyme and now we have one more enzyme which is basically the lactate dehydrogenase. So, lactate dehydrogenase what it does here you have a lactate and the hydrogen atoms have been pulled by NAD, NAD plus and here you get NADH plus H plus and here you see the hydrogen atoms are being plucked. So, that is why it is called dehydrogenation, dehydrogenase, dehydrogenation reaction and being catalyzed by dehydrogenase. So, you see over there it is not only playing a very important role in the mitochondria because energy production is dependent on NAD plus and NADPH. If you do not have these key molecules most of the biochemical reactions concerned with are happening inside the mitochondria would simply come to a halt. So, that way see the role of niacin it is so robust in most of the metabolic functions and thereby you find this particular cofactor playing a very important role in normal cellular process. So, you see over there niacin the nicotinic acid where all it is playing a role here you have beta hydroxy acyl CoA dehydrogenase. So, this is one particular enzyme where this acts like a cofactor. Here you have glutamate dehydrogenase again nicotinic acid is acting like a cofactor. Then you have alpha keto dehydrogenase which is also a important hormone in the energy metabolism. The pyruvate dehydrogenase again a very important enzyme in the metabolism of energy here you have glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. So, you see here lactate dehydrogenase. So, you see all those potential enzymes surround actually the main function of nicotinic acid. Apart from the therapeutic benefits nicotinic acid is extremely essential in the normal cellular reg regulation process. So, here you find apart from the carbohydrate metabolism you also see this particular vitamin niacin playing a very important role in the fatty acid metabolism that is why we have this picture. So, most of the images at the background have been blurred purposely so that you would know exactly the role they play. So, here you have pentose phosphate pathway a pentose phosphate pathway is the one which converts actually NADPH across you have the functional role that they are supposed to play. And here you see right from fat metabolism to carbate metabolism and in the regulation of protein niacin plays an excellent role. Here you find some of the pathways where the key enzymes are mentioned there. Okay, here you have tryptophan being the source material through a multi step process gets converted into quinolinic acid and this in turn you find over there enters nicotinamide deriponucleotide the pathway that you see over here. So, here the enzyme numbers are given so that we will be able to understand the significance of which enzyme is playing a role in this overall pathway. Although it is it looks like kind of challenging all these details have been worked out especially the role of how niacin gets incorporated into nicotinamide to really serve the purpose and it is all been taken care. Now, if you look at niacin 
One of the most primary benefits of niacin since the age began or since the niacin role has been established, people have always been uh, trying to connect the function of niacin with lipid metabolism. So, you see over there niacin treats dyslipidemia. So, what is this dyslipidemia? So, dyslipidemia is a metabolic problem where you have a problem in the proper utilization of lipids and the deleterious effects of the lipid metabolism is felt in this condition. So, this refers to simply irregularity, it is not working the way it is supposed to work. And you see over there when you treat a person simply with this particular vitamin taken regularly, you find a very interesting reduction in LDL and triglycerides which are supposed to be the culprits in most of the heart diseases. And alternatively quite surprisingly uh, you also find there is an increase in the HDL level. So, the profile goes like this, you should have an increase in HDL, a decrease in LDL and a decrease in triglycerides. Where else if it is the other way around, increase in LDL and increase in TG, where else decrease in HDL is not a good sign of development. So, that is how they gauge how the lipidemia conditions can be assessed. Now, since we are studying about niacin, niacin as a vitamin has a potential to have an impact on cholesterol metabolism. So, that is the way how this particular vitamin is being utilized in the therapy concerned with dyslipidemia. So, you see over there when you do a lipid panel test for any people who are susceptible probably of obesity or diabetes, you will need to look into these details, the total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. So, among them this HDL cholesterol alone is considered to be relatively a good cholesterol that tries to regulate the cholesterol not only for metabolism, but also for healing mechanisms and towards healthy inflammatory process. We need to have inflammatory process, only problem is the inflammatory process should not be too much where it could really create a catastrophe and can become harmful. Now, as long as if you could look at or associate niacin with lipid panel, definitely you would consider over a period of year you are able to really have a very good improvement in the level of HDL and a significant reduction in LDL and TG uh, triglyceride levels just with the supplement of niacin. So, that is a part over here. So, for people who are already suffering from stroke, you do not want them to have one more embolic atherosclerotic plaque coming up over there. So, in addition to aspirin, if you could put them on niacin, that sounds very interesting in terms of controlling the diabetic mode of diabetes. So, in that way this drug has been experimented for wide variety of uh, compounds especially in the in the presentation as a drug. Although it is as a vitamin, the moment you are going to supplement this vitamin for a different condition, it can very well be treated like a kind of a drug. So, in that way niacin although is a regular vitamin that helps in the cholesterol metabolism, but for people with dyslipidemia the same vitamin now becomes a medicine. So, that is something very special, very few vitamins would qualify to that level. Yeah, we know they are all playing an important role in the cofactor and in the metabolic pathway, but niacin's role is quite interesting. Apart from being a cofactor or an enzyme compound, it also plays a role in coordinating variety of activities in the biochemical pathway in human physiology. So, you look over there, so this is the reason. So, if a person is going to be on let us say a regular diet of niacin, you find you have to monitor these parameters, total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL and LDL. So, here you find all the bad cholesterol as we call it, the triglycerides and the LDL, their level comes down, where else the good cholesterol level shoots up, which is actually quite healthy when you consider if you have to take other supplementary drugs to address the issue of dyslipidemia. So, that way niacin has played a very tremendous role in not only curbing dyslipidemia, but also as a dietary supplement thereby creating or striking a balance. So, for people who are regularly taking niacin, it provides a dual responsibility. 
of treating the condition dyslipidemia at the same time you are in a better position where the overall well being of the vitamin can be realized. Now, maybe let, let me concentrate on one particular aspect. So, how niacin is able to do it? We already saw niacin as a very series of pathways where it is synthesized and utilized. Now, this is one session where you would be able to relate to what I am trying to say. See, let us say you have adipose tissue. So, adipose tissue consists of all fat tissues which are being stored. If that be the case, you look at it, there is an hormone called uh, an hormone sensitive to lipases. So, adipose tissue is the storage bin or the storage site of fats and here you have a lipase which is going to digest this storage resource of adipose. Now, you look over there, the hormone sensitive lipase basically converts this adipose lipase into free fatty acids, you get it and from there this free fatty acids which are liberated from the adipose tissue is being taken up by the liver and liver you know very well a good organ for storage as well as synthesizing. Now, transfers this and synthesizes triglycerides. The moment triglycerides are synthesized, they could be packed up as VDL, VLDL very low density cholesterol or LDL low density cholesterol. So, it is something like you see over here from uh, the pattern that adipose tissue fat can be actually burnt only in the presence of adequate amount of uh, nicotinic acid. So, otherwise this nicotinic acid lack of nicotinic acid would completely hamper this entire pathway. So, that way you see if you want to like burn the adipose tissue and hormone sensitive lipases take care and they jump into action and then they break down all the free fatty acids and all the free fatty acids being going to liver can burden the liver in storage. So, we do not want that to happen. Okay, so, look over here, here you find the hormone sensitive lipase is no longer uh, I would say uh, taken up and it is inhibited by niacin. So, niacin inhibits hormone sensitive lipase followed by free fatty acid production drastically comes down. Once these two things are taken care, you find an elevation in HDL, proportionately an elevation in HDL. Then you find the triglycerides are also uh, let us say uh, extravasated to the liver and niacin takes care of even triglycerides. So, knocking them down and prevents them from going to liver and thereby if triglyceride levels are brought down automatically VLDL levels will come down and if VLDL levels come down then you find a marked response in terms of LDL. So, you get the pathway. So, the previous pathway and the pathway in this are more or less same and here we depict exactly where this particular N, uh, vitamin would be useful in the fatty acid metabolism. So, I am going to summarize of what we have already seen. Today we have seen the historic background of niacin, the source of how niacin was associated with the deficiency condition called pellagra. Then what is the role of niacin? Niacin is a very important water soluble vitamin and without which none of NAD and energy mechanisms could ever even happen. Then we saw the overall biochemical role of niacin, how niacin helps in lowering the lipid profile. So, let me finish off with a question. So, state the connection between niacin deficiency and pellagra. So, that should be your first question and you know the answer we have discussed this and the second question would be uh, what is the difference between nicotinic acid and nicotine. So, this also I told nicotinic acid is basically a vitamin where else you have to consider the other way around. Now, uh, the third question would be what is the role of this particular water soluble vitamin niacin, how biochemically they place a role in terms of uh, what do you say uh, trying to understand the flow of lipid metabolism or in other words how actively they engage in lipid metabolism 
and how they play a very essential role in terms of maintaining the normal fat profile of an individual or if there is an increase in the fat profile, how intake of niacin regularly would add as a therapeutic tool in treating dyslipidemic conditions. So, today we saw how niacin plays a very important role in the energy metabolism of mitochondria and without niacin you would not have this cofactor NAD or NADPH which is extremely important in processing most of the energy related functions and above all you should also consider how niacin plays an important role in preventing this particular hormone sensitive lipase. Basically this particular enzyme breaks the adipose tissue and releases fatty acids. So, you see the crosses over there everywhere niacin goes and stops the function. So, when niacin interferes in this pathway unnecessary sorting of adipose and releasing triglycerides and an elevation in VLDL everything is put to halt. So, that way this is a very important cofactor not as a cofactor per se in playing a role in the metabolic function of the human physiology, but also it functions as a drug in the treatment of lipid metabolism or in other words as we call it dyslipidemia. So, niacin is an excellent drug that way used in the treatment of lipid related malfunctions or lipid metabolism in the long run. So, thank you for your attention.